Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is Media Truenet, and welcome back to Rome Total War, where it's finally happened. Probably the two greatest empires in the world right now, the Romans and the Egyptians, have finally come to blows, as we have begun a bit of a surprise assault here against a huge city. Our first huge city will be attacking, which is lovely, and with actual stone walls, though it is not particularly well defended. We're just going to get a quick murdering on their faction there, in fact, which is lovely. And that's not the only huge city we're attacking today, either. We're also going after Carthage. Fortunately, however, we've kind of got lucky with both of them, which is we've stumbled across them relatively undefended. And in Carthage, we've got another advantage, which is a Scipii army has just decided to come and squat outside the walls, presumably because it would really like to have taken over this city, but it didn't get there in time. Instead, Galerius Brutus, or presumably Brutus Africanus, as we'll very shortly begin calling him, can begin this siege right now because we have got ourselves rams, ladders, and towers absolutely perfect. But to be honest, there's not actually much point us fighting this because we can let the Scipii fight it for us. So I think we should definitely do that. Let's have a look at their general, by the way. He's he's a family member. He's got 73 people. Suggesting he was potentially at one point a factioner. Possibly he was... No. No, he's never been... Because like, if someone was a factioner and they get it taken off them, then they... I can't remember what they're called now. It's like X heir or something. Or disinherited or dis... I can't remember what it's called now. But basically, it's a bad thing. That's why you don't move um, factioner status around. Because you can move it around in your family tree screen. You don't want to do it too often. Because, yeah, you don't have in a situation where everyone's just got a negative trait. Because it is a mark of dishonour against them. This is a good guy, by the way. He's very, very secure. Possibly the Skippy I've been trying to assassinate him. I'm not sure. Because he's got plus two security together with plus one. One person security, they're obsessed by security plus four person security. Okay, this guy is basically unassassinatable, but that's fine, we'll just go in and murder him the old fashioned way. So here we are, a very decent sized army here, but you may notice, of course, the Scipii are drawn up on the other side. Normally, of course, like in a battle like this, they would actually be like, well, technically they're actually supposed to be coming from, yeah, I'm supposed to be at the north and they're supposed to be coming from this direction, but when it's a siege, they just start off on the field automatically. Often, the game does actually just gift them some free siege equipment as well, but on this occasion, they have not got it. Which is unfortunate for them, because that means when I've actually got a gate or something open, they're going to basically try and walk around the outside of the city, and they're not going to be smart enough to do it outside of the range of the towers. So basically, a huge amount of damage is about to be taken by the flipping Scipii, just because they desperately want to try and help. Vastly more than I've tried to help them. So welcome to a huge city, by the way, Carthaginian-style huge city. That is the, what is it called when it's a Carthaginian city? It is the Royal Palace. The Royal Palace of Numidia. Technically, of course, while these are the, um, the Numidians, this is kind of all in the Carthaginian style. I can't remember whether it actually was a huge city when the Carthaginians were defeated by the Numidians here. So it may have been built by the Numidians or the Carthaginians. I think, like, they share a culture, like the Greeks and the Macedonians do. Together with, ooh, elite cavalry stables. That is, ooh, a grand bazaar. That is, like, a big... Ooh, that's an execution square. Okay, now this is a really, really fun thing, by the way. Different factions have unique things for which there is no equivalent. So the Romans have no way of building an execution square, which is just, like, plus 10% to law. But if you move into a city that's got an execution square... You can just have an execution square. You can be a Roman city that's got an execution square in it. I can't remember what happens, by the way, if this hadn't been a very large city. So, like, if this had just been a minor city. I'd taken over, there was an execution square, and then I'd upgraded it to a Roman-style very large city. Because in that case, there's not a spot for an execution square. I know you still get it. I think at that point, it just doesn't appear on the map anymore if you look at your city. I can't actually remember. Still, all we need to do now is basically open up a breach for the Scipio to try and throw themselves through, and then they'll do the work for us. In which case, one unit of Astarte can just go and batter down the gates, potentially. Or, if no one really kind of shows up to defend, we could just basically send in a tower. What's actually up here, by the way? It is... It is one unit of desert infantry. Okay, well, in that case, we may as well approach from this angle. Has anyone brought, uh, I was about to say, the Principes on the towers? We didn't bring any Principes, unfortunately. Well, that's fine. All we're going to do is send our tower over here, because it's kind of coming from that angle. It should take very little fire. And as a result, my Hystarty can very easily murder these guys, because they're just basic spearmen, already a little bit weakened. Scipii aren't moving yet, so of course they don't have a way into the city. But as soon as there is a way into the city, they will actually go and move around to try and get to it. Okay, we've got a siege tower at the walls, and my men are climbing it. And interestingly, I just saw some flipping movement from the... Scipio. Okay, so they've seen the siege tower, so they've sent this one unit of Principes to actually go and climb the siege tower. But as you can see, they're going to stray way, way, way too close to the towers while they're doing it, because they think, okay, I'll send reinforcements to also climb up that siege tower, because you're allowed to use your allies' siege equipment if you're helping them take over a city. But yeah, 
They're going to walk literally underneath this tower. And the firing has already begun. And unfortunately, this is just bad luck for them. Of course, while they're running, the game does actually calculate, like, where the shield is. So they're being shot from this side. So as a result, yeah, they're not getting any benefit from their shields. If they'd been running the other way around the city, they would have actually gained benefit from their shields. So they'd have been shot from this angle and their shields would have actually absorbed a bit of the fire. It's just one of the lovely, elegant, quiet things Rome Total War does in the background. But instead, they've just lost like 10 men to one tower. And there's quite a few towers between these guys and the actual flipping city. So basically, I'm about to kill a pretty much full stack Skippy Eye army just by virtue of letting them be killed by towers. And in come my Hastati. Obviously, I want those guys to just murder all of these guys. They're actually in a pretty good place right now. I think this tower should have a shot at my Hastati. But right now, at least for the minute, the actual desert infantry are kind of actually shielding them. So they can't be shot. Though I think once they start kind of breaching through, then yeah, after that... Ooh! What the heck? Okay, we lost a lot of men really quickly to these desert infantry. Are these guys way more elite than I was... Wait, what?! What the hell is going on here? Um. Oh, okay. So, a thing that I wasn't expecting to just happen, which is my Hastati's being... Wait a flipping second here. What's going on? Desert Infantry, attack 8, defense 14. Hastati, attack... Oh, uh, only attack 7. Yeah, this is probably the problem of sending in completely inexperienced guys. I'm kind of used to my Hastati having, like, upgraded weapons, upgraded armor, upgraded everything. These guys don't have that. Okay, Skippy, I perhaps you could actually come and help a little bit faster, in fact. And incidentally, you guys, would you like to go over to here? You know what, let's just get the door down. In all fact, if we sacrifice some Astarte, we could rebuild them here. Let's actually get some reinforcements going in here. Ramming down the door of actual stone walls is a little bit tricky, by the way, because you see these little things up here? That pours out boiling hot oil. So you'll take a fair bit of damage while you're doing it. But yeah, these guys are totally gonna break, and that's really weird, in fact. Though, actually, now they're kind of going in quite slowly. They're just being killed one at a time. How much damage have you been done? You've done so little damage. How did you guys... I'm actually kind of shocked that this is happening. So, effectively, I'm not sure what these guys are doing. These guys are the big damn heroes of Numidia, unquestionably. How's that unit of Brinkipes doing, by the way? It is down from 162... 114 and falling together with being very tight. So before they even make it to the battle, they're going to be exhausted. They're going to slow down, walk past the towers for longer, and take even more damage. <laughs> oh dear. And they're going to break almost immediately as well. Right, my guys are... Oh no, the ram caught fire. That's very annoying. Get my Hastati out of there in that case. Fine, we've got these guys on the ladders, which will be all right. At this point, my lads are just hopping off the tower straight onto basically a giant pile of Roman corpses. And just in case you want them getting one kill, but quite frankly, I'm amazed they're doing so badly. Still, at least the Scipio are actually going to come in and flipping helpers right now, which is wonderful of them. In fact, oh, even more is coming. Okay, so they've detected my ladders are at the walls. And because there's like a single unit of ladders at the walls, the Scipio have decided to send five full units of infantry to go and support by also climbing those ladders. In fact, I've decided to order my guys off the walls over here, because now that so many flipping Skippy are coming, I may as well let them do the work. So hang on, guys, guys, guys. Uh, what they do, by the way, if you try and order them off the walls again, is the guys who are climbing up the ladders have to finish climbing up the ladders. Then as soon as that's done, then guys at the top will immediately start climbing straight back down again. Because you are totally allowed to climb down ladders as well as back up them. So the Numidians are now flipping coming in the bastards. And we're basically just abandoning the walls at this point. Uh, so sadly guys, some of you are going to get yourselves a little bit spiked. But never mind. Interestingly, the Romans are not even interested in kind of defending themselves while they're being stabbed from behind. But never mind. So the surviving 27 men of this unit have started climbing. This has just been... This has just been a catastrophe for no well-explained reason. We've just lost so many men for literally no reason whatsoever. I should have just dumped basically some ladders against the walls and then straight away just abandoned the rest. These guys are going to take unnecessary flipping casualties as well. These guys are... Okay, so a few of these guys are just going to stand and fight against the Numidians. Lovely. And the rest of these guys are basically just going to flee. Nice. Then we just get these guys back and we decide to see what the Skippy Ives are... No! No, what are you doing? Don't go back up the ladders! That's not what I told you to do! Oh, this unit of infantry is so confused about what it wants to do with its life right now. Oh, bloody hell, the Numidians are pursuing down the ladder. A couple of Numidians have hopped on the ladders and they're coming down onto the ground. I genuinely didn't know they could even do that. That if you actually retreat down the ladders uh, by ordering them, sometimes the enemy decides to follow. 
I had no idea that was a thing, but luckily those two guys at least are hopefully going to get themselves murdered. Right, now we get out of here, and these exhausted, extremely damaged Prinkipairs are actually now going to try and climb the ladders, supported in a moment by a huge amount of Hastati that's just running- Oh, I think the entire army decided it wants to come. I think more's coming yet. No, 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 half the army decided it's not coming yet, but as soon as they take a gate, the rest of them are totally going to just come around the edge of the city. Now, I don't mean to alarm anyone, but the Prinkipairs have completely abandoned the ladders. They're not bothering. Are you guys going for the siege tower? Where are you going? Where is this entire Skippy I force coming if not for the ladders? Yeah, they've gone for the siege tower. They've decided they want this siege tower to move up to the walls and they're now going to use this siege tower if I'm not going to bother with it. And as the exhausted Prinkipers make their way up this tower, that means this is the right moment now for the rest of the army to start moving, because I can see the rest of them on the move at this point. So now the entirety of the rest of the army, with the exception of the cavalry, which is staying back for the moment, and the war dogs, the war dogs aren't heading in yet, the entire rest of the force is now heading around this side of the city, where they will also be shot by towers. But of course, uh, yeah, because they've actually got their shields by their sides, they'll actually take less damage than their compatriots did. If these 32 exhausted Prinkipers actually do a better job versus those desert infantry than my full strength unit for Stati, that is just going to be straight up embarrassing. But it's quite possible they will because these guys are actually heavy infantry rather than light. Though obviously they're already shaken and they haven't even started the fighting yet, so it doesn't look good for these guys. But there is more Hastati coming up to support them. It begins and these Numidians are once again doing a terrifyingly good effective job against heavy flipping infantry. They do appear to be winning, but... The Prinkipers are slowly grinding them down. This is... These guys are heroes. I feel like I should just dedicate this episode to these Desert Infantry. Like, they started off with, I think, 147 men, if I was going correctly. Like, they've defended the walls against multiple attacks. They've gone up against actual swordsmen, against heavy infantry. And they're still winning for the moment. Yep, they've just managed to basically finish off the Prinkipers at almost no loss, and now the Hastati are starting to pile in. But the Hastati are going to come in one at a time, which gives the advantage significantly to the... Also, the Hastati decided they just want to run over there rather than actually fighting, so that's good. Basically, this siege tower is a great big skippy eye meat grinder, because they're just going to keep tossing in light infantry and just get themselves killed. The pile of corpses is already growing. I want to know who these guys are. Who are these desert infantry, these magnificent heroes? Can we recruit them for my side? Well, the Scipio continue to die, I'm pretty sure they've just drawn up a bunch of people back there who are just being shot by the gateway, so good work there. By the looks of it, the Scipio are having to toss in about five men for every kill against this unit of supermen. Ah, but the reinforcements from that side of the city have arrived. Marvellous. So now a bunch of Prinkipes are showing up, which should do a little bit better, albeit not much. Oh no, it's finally happening. The Scipio have actually got a fair few Prinkipes up top, enough that they can actually do a significant amount of damage to these guys. So now it's going to start becoming a fair fight. These guys are probably, yeah, steady. Oh, it's going to be all over for these magnificent heroes soon, and then the Scipio can actually go in. I just want to do a quick tour of the outside of the city, by the way, because that over there, <laughs> that's the Skippy I dead. There's some more Skippy I dead. Oh, that over there, that's Skippy I dead. Let's just go over to some more towers. That's, oh, that's all Skippy I dead. Yep, fine, lovely. Now around to the other side, there's... This unit's just standing here because it can see the Skippy I dead. There's no I <laughs> just love the past of Skippy I dead. There's just a trail of breadcrumbs of dead Romans all around the city. It's beautiful. And now, hilariously, having actually taken the walls, the actual Skippy I don't actually know what to do next. They're not sending their guys to take over. All right, guys, you know what? I'll help you out. I sent my 26 survivors from my attempt to take the walls from those ridiculous superhuman supermen to actually go and take the gateway so the rest of you can get inside. And there we are, with the walls taken, these guys will now all pile inside and go and take out the faction, kind of, well, former faction era, I guess, for me. Which is lovely to go with, oh yeah, he's got camels which aren't very good, but heavy cavalry which are very, very good indeed, so that's going to be difficult for them. And I think something is still guarding the walls around here, hang on, let's move around here, what is it? It is just one unit of, oh, just archers, oh, they probably murdered a fair few Romans on the way past too. Oh, hang on, they're not done throwing men away yet. As it turns out, the war dogs are now just going to circle their way around the outside of the city, having their handlers picked off as they go. Beautiful. You know, I would not actually bet against the flipping Carthaginians, or rather Numidians, sorry, actually winning this battle against the Scipiones. Because at this point, like, all of the infantry is badly damaged and exhausted. A single cavalry charge will probably just make it break and trigger a mass rout. 
Oh, and even more hilariously, they've actually decided to also walk around the inside of the city past yet more towers, so they're even flipping weaker than they were a second ago. Marvellous. But they actually have brought some Triarii. Not many, but there are actually spearmen which will help, but oh no. <laughs> they've got more towers to go past yet, unfortunately. So three units of Scipio infantry over here, basically so badly damaged as almost to be worth counting out. Over here, about, what, six or seven units that are basically as good as almost dead, and they've got more towers to walk past yet. Yeah, I genuinely think the Scipio are going to be wiped out to the last man, which works so well for me. Speaking of which, here comes the first actual conflict inside the city. Numidian javelin men have decided rather than throwing javelins, they're going to engage in one-to-one -one combat, which does rather work in favour of the Roman infantry. But the Roman infantry is so badly damaged here, this could be the revenge of the Numidians for what happened over at Kerta. Ah, but this time the Numidian archers have actually figured out what bows are, which is magnificent, so they are actually being fired upon. But for the moment at least, yeah, there's enough infantry here, it's all clustered together, they can do a pretty good job. So they should just be able to chew their way through the archers and the javelin guys. But that heavy cavalry, that is going to wipe out so many Scipiones. And oh, the route has already started happening. One unit of Brinkipes is giving up. And are these guys going to stand and fight? Well, they're going to get one decent peeler throw in. Even if they're exhausted, heavy infantry will always chew through archers. Those guys are going down very, very fast indeed, so they're a bit screwed. And the archers break, but this is the crucial moment right here. The flipping Skippy Eye infantry are now going to enter the plaza, and they're going to get charged by the cavalry, and I suspect they're just going to break immediately. That's going to be it. Done. Oh, the general's showing some interest. Is he ready to go in? Not quite this second. Still just chewing fruit. No, nope. General's backing off for a sec. He doesn't quite want to do this. In comes the heavy cavalry. They're going to get in a good charge. And that is going to be it. That's going to be it for all those units. That unit's broken. That one's wavering too. Those Brinker Bears are fighting, but they just do not have the fighting strength to take on 73 heavy cavalry. Not a bloody chance, in fact. Yep. That is that force that came through this way, completely wiped out to the last man. In comes the secondary force around here. There's there's a bit left, including some Triarii, but only 32. General doing a competent job here. Rides all of those guys down. This could not have gone more perfectly, as far as I'm concerned. The Scipii are going to be completely eliminated. All they've got left over here is one unit of Equites, their captain. There's what you've just seen over there. There's also over on this side... What do they even have left on this side? They've got... Ah, that's a retreating unit. Fine. And then over here, they're... Ah! They've got the war dogs coming in. Fine. Well, the war dogs might do some damage, but not much. And that's it. Romans there wiped out to the last man. General returns to the plaza. And now the exact same thing, very likely, is about to happen over here. And once all that's done, I'm going to have to go and deal with this bloody general myself. And Prinkipes get hit by a good camel charge there. That was a good camel charge. Was that? Yep, that was the Prinkipes. They're already... Yep, they are broken. Lovely. Probably Mass Route's going to trigger... Nope, that's already triggered there. Those are started already broken. These guys will break momentarily. Oh, but they have killed one of the generals. Not the actual general general. They killed the reinforcing army's general. And that's that army all mopped up as well. What's going to be left here? These Hastati will basically break immediately. Yep, Hastati are not going to hold the line when everything else is already broken. Indeed, that is pretty much the end of the Scipii force. Well, while we just let the war dogs go in and soften them up for me, in that case, I may as well head in and start doing my job. So first things first, of course, the most sensible thing you can do, let's just open a nice clear path for me. And we'll do that by sending the 26 Hastati that were part of the war force around here to take all of the towers before we actually move the rest of my men in. Okay, it's not perfect because I don't have any proper actual heavy infantry, but a bit of a three-way trap here with hot plights and tunes of Astarte should at least be able to significantly wear down a general's bodyguard. But yeah, he's rather annoyingly on the far side of a large plaza, so I can't bait him off. I may just need to use my archers to pull him forward. Uh, he might be willing to react the moment my archers step onto the plaza. If so, yep, fine. There we go. There we go, guys. Get back off the plaza, please. And yeah, he's coming, he's coming. The, the camels are coming first, which works for me, because if the camels come first, you guys are already at fire at well, right? Yeah, you guys are already at fire at well. Archers can pull back. Those camels are going to go into the hot plights with Hastati supporting. They will go down very, very quickly indeed. And yeah, they will be absolutely screwed. Lovely. So, Numidian camel raiders, sorry, riders are going to go down. They're already, yeah, they're trying to pursue, they're trying to pursue kind of through 
which isn't going to work for them. Archers are just going to fire in. Those archers took a little bit of damage once we were at the front line. But we've actually got some arrows onto the general, which is going to pull the general in, which works for me. That's going to do a fair bit of damage. He's down to 72. Right. These guys now just have to stand and fight. We've got the hoplites at the side who will just kind of spike anything that gets too close to him. These guys are shaken, but protracted infantry slugging match will actually work in their favour. They may well break, to be honest, but they're shaken, not broken. They'll be all right for now. And uh, the hoplites aren't really at the right angle, to be honest. You guys actually go in properly. I'm going to take these guys off guard mode just to kind of spread out a bit more. Just to kind of try and eat some of the damage. Because, like, if the general spread between these three units, not one of them's actually going to do enough damage. And, oh, I think he's kind of drawing his attention to the flipping... Oh, uh, yeah, he's kind of going over to the hoplites, which is annoying. Never mind. Oh, well, the hoplites are just going to take some damage, but that's all right. The... Ooh, on the plus side, the arch to the back have just done some really lovely damage. Uh, these guys are down to 65. They're not going down that fast, are they? That unit just broke as well. Right. Um, basically, just... Okay, just fire. Just fire at will. No, no flipping anything like that. Oh, everything just broke. Yeah, we've got some problems with morale here. Shoot them in the back. Archers, just shoot those guys in the back. You'll do at least some good damage that way. And I guess it's up to the general to do a fair bit of damage here. This is... Yeah, not great, to be perfectly honest. Uh, actually, I'm going to get the general out and send in these uh, Hastati. These Hastati can go in right now. On the plus side, I think these archers are actually just firing directly into the side of those flipping guys. You're actually firing, by the way. Come on, reload. And uh, you're not properly firing, which is a shame. Actually, if you guys can just literally push past them, you can shoot them in the back. Guys, just get around the back of them and then just start shooting them in the back over and over and over again. It'll be beautiful. And no, they broke first. Oh, we almost got the general there, but he escaped from the death cut scene, which is unfortunate. Right, he is down to 34. Taking out generals is such a lot of work, damn it. Damaged hoplites are back in the game and the archer is just going to keep baiting the general forward so we can't get back on the plaza because every time he gets hit, he gets pulled back towards our infantry. And then we just keep shooting him. The hoplites will do some good work. Oh, look at that. These guys have already taken a lot of knocks. They've lost some of their hit points already. So, of course, that's the strength of generals. They do indeed have uh, two hit points. But they've used up that second hit point already. Now they're going down way, way faster. And this is it. They've kind of lost their strength at this point. So, now we'll just take them out with the archers. The hoplites are already badly damaged. So, maybe we'll just pull those guys. Oh, I think he finally went down. Hopefully he'll break in a moment. What a destructive battle. I will end that battle. I want to see the stats for this. <laughs> he got 2,898 kills with 400 men because the kills of the towers count as his. And the poor Skippy Eye. Yeah, they showed up with 2,476 men. They got 300 kills, less than 300. And they've only got 500 people remaining because they did not get many of those men back. Oh, that's hilarious. That's absolutely a thing of beauty. Their army doesn't break apart, though, because just enough of it, over 20%, I believe it is, does actually still stand. And, of course, we are going to exterminate this population, because otherwise, this being a huge city, it would be very difficult to manage. So, exterminate the population, and also get 11,000 denarii from looting, and the city will become happy again. It's like, I feel like happy's not the best descriptor. Like, you know, subservient, because they're too terrified to actually fight back. Fine. I feel like happy is not the right way to describe it. Because, of course, you've got such the population, like, say, Squalor has just been removed, for example. Resistance is indeed futile at Carthage. Harsh times demand harsh measures. In all fairness, it would be wrong if we didn't horribly put Carthage to the sword. It's kind of what ultimately historically happened. Now, if I recall correctly, Carthage has a really high... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Carthage has a really, really flipping high growth. In fact, it's kind of being artificially boosted by food imports there. So Carthage is going to grow insanely fast, like 400 a day, even from a population of only 4,000. No wonder this place got up to a huge city in no time whatsoever. So obviously, I would like to retrain all my damaged troops. And then there's so many different things I could theoretically build. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. I know there's stuff in the city. There we are. So, large temple of Baal. We may as well get rid of that now, to be honest, because, yeah, we may as well get rid of it while kind of population order's in good state anyway. We've already got the elite cavalry stable, so we can already have races, so if we need to, we can do uh, races to improve population. I could get these guys, like, hmm. Like, this is the thing, like, when you've got high-growth cities, 
Juno's tempting, because from Juno you get health bonuses that kind of avoids plague breaking out. But like, if you pile on to 7% natural growth rate and food imports, like Juno as well, like, ultimately the city just gets too big. It gets, like, excessively like This is the one problem the Brutii have with their religion. They don't have the equivalent of Saturn or Bacchus or Jupiter that the other two factions do. They don't have just a straight up every level is worth plus 10% happiness straight up. All of theirs do something more interesting. Well, we may as well go for Mercury. This place can certainly make an awful lot of money with its trade, so let's go for Mercury. Let's get a Roman religion in play. After that point, I might build an academy pretty soon, because Galerius Brutus, or Brutus Africanus as we shall now be calling him, yeah, he's kind of still young and inexperienced, so potentially it might well be useful for him to gain some experience. Now, the Scipio are also, they might be thinking about moving down here to Siwa and then moving on, well, hopefully against Egypt, because they are at war with Egypt, because they have to be, because I'm at war with Egypt, so they'll do it in sympathy. But still, I'm very glad that we've taken Carthage, because having taken Carthage now, we're in good shape that uh, when the Civil War breaks out, we can just hold out against the Scipii right here. Carthage, for the Scipii, is the equivalent of my Patavium up north for the Julii. We've now got two very good holdout cities in play. Now over here to Egypt, where we should have a much less ridiculously messy fight, because yes, we've only got, well, we've got ourselves Egyptian chariot archers, and we've got the faction now. Now, Egyptian family members are interesting and unique, well, not quite unique actually, because they travel around um, in Egyptian chariots. When all they basically are actually Egyptian chariot archers, except as you can see there, mysteriously the Egyptian chariot archers are pictured with an extra archer, but I think they are pretty much as effective as each other. Broadly, anyway, chariot archers are a real, real pain out in the field because they can basically just move around you. They're very fast. They're not quite as fast as, say, light cavalry, but they're still much faster than any infantry you're going to run into. Yeah, melee attack 10, missile attack 10. Pretty damn good, all things good. So they can just kind of charge into infantry formations and do a lot of damage and spook them as well because they frighten nearby infantry because, yeah, they're just kind of scary and intimidating and whatever. And they will do a fair amount of damage with their bows. But in all fairness, like, next to a unit of archers, they probably won't do that much damage. It's more about the morale penalty and the maneuverability, to be honest. So we just need to go in there and destroy those guys. Sadly, I don't actually have any flipping hoplites with me, because hoplites versus chariots is a walkover. In fact, actually, before we fight this battle, I'm going to show you something very quickly. I've just started a custom battle here with myself as the Greek cities. And as the Greek cities, I've given myself precisely one unit. And that one unit is Militia Hoplites, the crappy, basic, low morale lads who've basically got no armor, who we've been killing as the flipping Brutii since the very beginning of the game. And I've set up a bridge battle. And I've given the Egyptians 2,000 of their best heavy chariots. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move these guys into position right up here. I'm going to tell these guys to stop there. And I'm going to tell them to go into a phalanx formation. And then, basically, we're going to watch what happens next. And what happens next is these guys are going to start dying. Because this is what happens to chariots. Basically, oh, their leader just decided to go in first. That's good. Basically, chariots will, if they just touch the front of a phalanx, die pretty much immediately. And by the way, the wheels just keep going out of the back of a chariot. Actually, you know, they might actually win this because they've managed to actually pile through enough to break out the, uh, the phalanx, which is a shame. Okay, I'm starting to do this again a little bit more fair. So this time I'm on the Carthaginians with two units of decent phalanxes. So now we're going to see how this goes this time. And this is a bit more fair, I would say. Lovely. So now we're just going to watch the Egyptians dogpile into this lovely little area. Just look at the wheels. I just love watching the wheels. And all of that. Yep, the general's dead. General's dead there. So basically, yeah, what you really need is you just need two phalanxes. And then this is just... This is just a meat grinder. Just look at the wheels. I just, this is my favorite thing in all of Rome to the War, that when a chariot dies, its wheels fling forward. So if you just basically have a bridge battle, which is nothing but chariots, then all these wheels just pile, pile through. Let's just kind of swing around to get the view here. There's all the deceased guys and all of their deceased chariots. These guys are just basically there. If a, if a chariot just basically touches the front of a phalanx, it will die. But there was enough that you could just dogpile into a single unit. But, like, this is how you really want to use phalanxes, by the way, on bridges. You don't want just, like, one covering the front. You want, like, a little archway on the front here. And it's just a thing of utter carnage and beauty. And incidentally, because the chariots are so big, they will just kind of push themselves into the water. And the moment they touch the water, they will just die. <laughs> 
And that, that horse is just, I don't know what that horse was doing. Uh, these guys are just kind of slowly slipping down this bridge. And the moment they touch the water, that unit will die. I mean, they're, they're vaguely trying. These guys are trying to flee. These guys aren't. So these guys are going to hit the water in a moment and they'll be dead at the time. Meanwhile, at the front, there's just, oh, oh, the leader, the leader is breaking. And if he's not already dead, and I'm pretty sure he is already dead. Those guys are just, oh, oh, yeah. Someone just died there by falling in the water. It's beautiful. Forward they go into the flipping, just slowly pushing forwards. And yes, we will win this fight. We will win this fight. And like, if you set up your hoplites correctly, you notice I haven't actually taken a casualty yet. 161, 161, it's 162 because of the generals in that unit. And I've also got myself two units of experience. So at this point, they're just trying to push forward, but they can't even like make contact with it. It's just such a huge pile of destroyed chariots. It's beautiful. And off the chariots go, having realised there's probably not much they can do. And instead, just leaving behind a giant pile of wheels, which are just the most beautiful of all things. Let's just quickly move our lads off here. Out of the phalanx formation, let's just have a little look at the pile of corpses, which includes not a single Carthaginian. And instead, we've got, yes, this beautiful, massive pile of chariots who just all died in the same way, together with a body of water that is... Actually, the perspective that's really... The perspective is really weird, in fact, but all right. Yeah, and a huge number of chariots just kind of fell off the bridge and ran into each other. Oh, there's just a... Oh, look at all those that just got stuck under there. That's beautiful. And that's why, as a Roman faction, you always want to buy flipping mercenary hotplates when you see them. They may not be very good, but they'll be good enough if you put them at a bridge and the enemy happens to have chariots to utterly destroy that otherwise quite dangerous unit. Anyway, in we go. Let's go take out the factionary of Egypt. So say hello to an Egyptian huge city. And I've got to say, I like this one. because The Egyptian huge city has the Pharaoh's Palace. Which is a beautiful big old building. Sorry, it's kind of accidentally went inside just a bit there. Yeah, Pharaoh's Palace massively. Like, I can only get the camera to be this high up. But you can kind of... Uh, but the building is way taller. So you can push the camera a little bit higher uh, using this building. It's a great building. Look at that. That's just absolutely beautiful, isn't it? With everything on it. Indeed, it's a lovely building. What else have we got down here as well? We have got ourselves Large Temple of Horus. We'll be demolishing that. City Barracks. That's level... Three, I think. I think that's a level three thing because uh, it would be army and then pharaohs, if I remember correctly. Execution square that we can keep for us. Grand Bazaar. Beautiful. I think the layout is identical to the Carthaginian cities, actually. I think it's actually... Uh, wait, is this the same? Hang on. This would be... Yes. The layout is, in fact, identical to the Carthaginian cities. I'd never noticed that before. But yes, actually, um, even though the Egyptians do have their own unique style of buildings, uh, actually, yeah, it looks like the city layouts for Carthaginian, Numidian, and Egyptian are actually identical. So that's nice. Um, plus, by the way, these guys don't actually have uh, anything in the way of infantry. Uh, chariots can't be on the walls, so therefore we can just stroll in and take the walls. No sweat whatsoever. Speaking of which, one unit of Brinkipairs over here can just head over to here and they should be absolutely fine lovely although wait hang on wait what where's where are you oh you've decided to be over here fine so you're are you the actual you are the oh yeah you're the actual flipping faction now but uh, fortunately, you have decided to back off to the actual main square. We should be able to pick these bikes apart pretty easily with our Cretans, by the way. Um, the thing about chariots is they hit hard, they're very annoying, but they're defensively flimsy. So they'll fall apart pretty quickly to the Cretans. Yep, I picked the angle they approach from pretty well. They're going to make it up to the walls without actually having taken a single casualty. Beautiful. So, these Brinker pairs can now just head around here and clear out the walls for me. Though they will take a little bit of light damage from doing that. Same as last time. Now, I do have Triarii with me, but a thing I don't actually know off the top of my head. I'm not sure whether Triarii and Spearmen actually gain an advantage versus Chariots. So I don't think chariots are technically considered cavalry. They're not trained at cavalry stables. And even though they're led by horses, I think they're treated differently to cavalry. So I don't think spearmen have an advantage. But if you happen to know that off the top of your head, could you let me know in the comments? I'm genuinely not sure whether spearmen gain their bonus damage versus cavalry versus chariots. I don't think they do, but I may be wrong. I'm also trying to remember off the top of my head whether Egyptian chariot archers and the Egyptian general themselves... Whether they have short or long range missiles, I cannot for the life of me recall. I think they are coming by the way, which isn't the worst thing in the world. If they decide they want to charge me, then I'll just basically get some peeler in on them. They don't really want to be involved in this sort of a significant charge anyway. You guys are all in position, right? Yeah, you're all in position for now. So in which case, uh, guys, just stop. 
and start firing if you'd be so kind. The Cretan archers, though they might take a little bit of a light knock, should basically tear these guys apart pretty quickly. And you guys, as soon as your Pila are all in position. Yeah, they're going for my infantry, not the archers right now, which is good. And there we go. In come the Pila. In come the archers. This is a chariot general, but he will go down pretty darn quickly to Cretan archers. Oh, we got really lucky there. Their actual leader decided to go in early. So he's gone down pretty quickly. Those guys are down to 60, 58, 57, 54. Yeah, these things next to this like standard heavy cavalry. Oh, we've already won. Oh, well, all right, fine. I'll take it. I think one of them managed to get through. And yeah, one of them just came under fire there. I'm willing to end the battle there, quite frankly. The general's dead. The rest just decided to surrender. Fine, no problem at all. 19 to the Cretans, and sadly, we didn't get any of them back. That's a shame, so one of my unit of Cretans has just taken a knock. Nice, simple one there. Obviously, we're burning the city to the ground as well, because it's going to be miserable as anything, so we're just going to exterminate it. Get a huge pile of money out of that. Lovely. Now, let's learn a bit more about this city here. Large Temple of Horus. Don't need that. Thank you. Let's have a look see at the growth rate here. Only 4.5. As it's not huge, I'm going to go for the actual uh, Juno. Because I don't mind boosting it. And basically, Juno does double up as happiness as well. Because you get the bonus for um, the entertainment. And you also get the bonus to health, which does impact public order. It'll make the city grow a bit faster, but that's fine. I'm okay with that. Also, a uh, fun thing that I just saw we got there. Obviously, we've got a couple of buildings we haven't really seen before. So, this is a level 5 building that has, like, some really good infrastructure in terms of, like, market. Therefore, you can have the most advanced stuff in terms of uh, foundry. That's basically, it goes blacksmith, armour, then foundry at level 5 cities, which gives you plus 2 to heavy, light, missile, and armour. Like, this place is really, really amazing. It might be worth me just building that right now, but actually, I would rather probably just get paved roads up as soon as possible just so i can actually move my troops around so at this point we have now got ourselves two cities with walls but the egyptians are coming in in a hurry so let's be a little bit careful here incidentally anything interesting we can train we can train assassins here if we need to we can retrain all these guys why are these Cretan archers being offered retraining oh it's probably because we've got an armor here so plus one two missile weapons yeah perfect famous orator Blimey, okay, next time he fights a battle, I might just actually let him speak. That's very, very good indeed. Fruitful, refined taste draftsman. Oh, yes. He's rather good, aside from the fact that he is massively corrupt. That's a good point, actually. Where did Valerius the Killer end up? Oh, there he is. There's Valerius the Killer. There we go. Egyptian goes down. Lovely. Valerius the Killer doing his job. Get him down here. Yeah, basically, if anyone actually shows up who looks like an actual leader, you're the faction leader over there, by the way. Not doing a great job in Jerusalem, by the way. Can't have noticed your councillors' chambers have been, you know, set on fire by revolting peasants. In all fairness, Egypt does have a lot of trouble with uh, revolts and general civil disobedience. It happens an awful, awful lot. Incidentally, now we've taken Carthage and all of that, what are we up to at the minute? We are up to... 29 regions controlled and of course like when we talk about uh 50 regions and rome like taking rome well rome's one and then we're gonna have to take out a fair amount of the julii and the scipii like probably you want to hit like 35 to 40 ish before you begin the civil war probably 35 is fine then the rest you get off the romans so we're not too far away from that sort of place so egypt are what is your counter attack if anything one what looks like decent but not huge army decides to besiege antioch one okay not too bad, to be honest, I would say. I think, actually, they've made a mistake there. Uh, 127 men. Where's that happening, by the way? That is... Ooh. Yeah, one mid-sized, not spectacular little fleet as I head over towards Kedonia. And it's just taken out that ship. That's fine. That doesn't really matter. They'll probably be annoying and besiege a couple of ports. We may need to build a just a small fleet just to defend the Greek sea trade. And would you believe a new man, Gaius Marius, because over in Batavia we have our first huge city. Gaius Marius has proposed a series of laws that allow the proletariat to join his reorganised Roman army in return for many years of military service. Every soldier will be given land as a kind of pension. This reform is passed in the People's Assembly without the approval of the Senate. It is a certainty that such popular and populist appeal will do Marius no favours in the long run. The troop types available for recruitment now reflect the structure of this new professional army. Check the recruitment scroll to view the details. Basically, the entire old Roman army has just been tossed in the bin and we've got a brand new army, but it is a vastly superior army, but this does create a few small problems. 
Incidentally, we mysteriously have literally all of the announcements in the world to get through. Uh, blockade Jerusalem, we can certainly do that at some point. What, what is all this? Oh! Huge amounts of cities have just, just happened to expand simultaneously. Uh, Bylazora, minor city, that's absolutely fine, get rid of that. Uh, oh, it's expanded. Uh, Rhodes, ooh, Rhodes is up to large city already, that's fine. We've got all this money from all the ransacking, so we can afford all of this. Together with, we know about the two settlements that were besieged. And, ah, through a glass, clearly, while the Egyptians have made coloured glass for many years, the Carthaginians have perfected a method for making clear glass. The new clear goblets are much prized across the world by people of taste and discernment. So... You know, in some ways, it's not going well for the Carthaginians, as they are now apparently restricted to a single little crappy under the middle of the sea. But on the plus side, they have glass. So that's nice, isn't it? And faction announcements do we have? Ah, we've got someone new. We have got someone new. Please be good. Please be good, for the love of God. Well, whoever is, he's already picked up a lovely little kind of battlefield surgeon, so that's nice. Uh, Byzantium. Feeling poorly. Not good. Uh, draftsman. Good. Stern. Looks alright for now, but it does get bad if it kind of gets too severe. Publicly Law Gourmand. Oh, okay. So he is basically uh, Lentilus the Fat. Beautiful. So we need to find this guy somewhere too. He's not really kind of much of a... Yeah, he's a manager. That's the thing. He's more of a manager. And I can't believe, incidentally, that... Ooh! Aulus Augustus! Wow! Okay, you have got yourself a great little name there. Blimey, Aulus Augustus. I didn't even realise you could actually pick up the name Augustus this early in the game when you hadn't actually kind of done any of the stuff like that. Wow, okay. That's great. Refined tastes, frugal, uh, weirtus. Ah, oh, weirtus. The, the most important idea of all of Romans. The idea of uh, manliness. The, yeah, the idea of it, the quality of a true man, as it's put there. Some kind of form of bravery and and kind of uh, public spiritedness and oh it's way too just a lovely idea we don't we can't really translate it you cannot really translate it there's no word for it, it it's it's just a it's just romanishness in many ways it's just a single word that just sums up manly romanishness which is lovely so he's got that oh i love that we are being led by aulus augustus and he used to be aulus victor but now he's upgraded to augustus that's gorgeous Oh, yeah, you can see some of the troop types there. Uh, let me just try and remember where we've actually got the most different types of troop buildings, and I'll show off our new army. Sparta. This will do absolutely perfectly. So Sparta basically is a minor city that's got everything you can build in a minor city in it. So this is basically like the sort of military infrastructure you're likely to have all over the shop you can now gain at Sparta. So what we've got is peasants and town watch are unchanged. The Velites have now been upgraded to light auxilia. Honestly, there's very little change there. It's kind of a bit of just a change of a name to be honest like there's there's not much there like those velites they look a bit better because uh, these guys are so heavily upgraded for example uh the light auxilia are i think a little bit better if they had the same level of upgrade so that's absolutely fine you still got ballistas there's no change to things like uh ballistas or onages those remain completely unchanged arguably to my mind the most important thing of all archers have been upgraded to archer auxilia now, unlike your basic archers, these archers are, one, a lot more powerful, and two, they have long-range missiles. They can shoot, I'm not sure if it's actually, equal, like, twice as far, but it's a lot further. Basically, they've got a huge amount more range. It's basically the exact same range as the Cretan archers have. So now, I can train units that are as powerful as Cretan archers, I can just pump them out of every archery range I've got. Replacing Hastati in a way, but not really, is the auxilia. To be precise, all I mean by that is, in places where I used to be able to build Hastati, I can now build auxilia. Now, this is interesting, because... Rome used to have a bit of a spearman problem, which is you didn't get spearmen until you had triarii, which were unlocked at barracks level... Is it four? Yeah, barracks level four. So large cities with fully upgraded barracks were allowed to train triarii. Up until that point, Rome didn't have spearmen. Now you get spearmen relatively early on. They're not great. Attack of eight with a charge bonus of two is not spectacular. But defense of 19 is solid and you get that bonus fighting cavalry, which is very, very welcome. It's just nice that Rome can now train spearmen earlier in the game. Equitas have been replaced with Roman cavalry, a little bit better, but honestly it doesn't make a huge amount of difference, all things considered. And cavalry auxilia, I think, stay unchanged. It's one of the very few units that stays completely unchanged. However, um, what used to happen at places where you had like elite cavalry stables is you used to basically gain uh, very little at the high levels. Like Rome, there was no point taking your stables up to the high level because you just didn't kind of get anything good out of it. Now you do. So beyond Roman cavalry at hippodromes, we now gain legionary cavalry and, oh, nope, sorry, it's Circus Maximus. We also gain Praetorian Cavalry. Basically, you can train your own extremely strong cavalry. So these guys are, yeah, defensive 22, attack.
attack of 8 is not spectacular, but with the charge bonus it's alright, and the Praetorian Cavalry are really where it's at. Attack of 11 with a charge bonus of 6, and again defense of 22. Very, very nice indeed. Back over to the barracks, however, and this is where things start getting interesting. In place of the Principes, we now have the early legionary cohort. These guys are absolutely brutal. They do function basically like Hastati or Principes do, uh, insofar as, you know, they're still basically infantry. They've got a shield, they've got a sword, they've got the peeler to throw, except they're just a lot tougher. You'll find they survive a lot, lot better. They also can form a testudo, a little turtle, so they can basically kind of do the thing that Romans are famous for doing, where they kind of lock their shields around them in order to protect themselves from missile fire. You will basically never do it while you're actually in the game. Like, well, 99% of the time it will never be worth doing. But, you know, it's nice to know it's there. And then you can get those guys up to legionary cohorts and praetorian cohorts. And, oh, those guys will just, basically they'll just chew through anything. Like, you don't want to throw them straight to the front of, say, phalanxes, but other than that, they'll basically chew through anything you throw at them. So basically what we want to start doing immediately is training a new style army here. The problem that we've got is the troops that you've already trained at this point now can't be retrained. So of course those unit types aren't available for recruitment anymore, so you can't retrain them. So at this point your old armies are kind of stuck in a bit of a difficult position where if an old army gets like a bit damaged, you can't retrain it. So you just have to just basically slowly merge your old armies together and just kind of use them. I just generally use them for garrison troops to be honest. Pretty much as soon as possible, you you want to have good new troops entirely on your front line because they're just such a good step up. But those old troops will still do the job incidentally. So basically we just want to be powering out, how many people are here by the way? Yeah, a fair number. We basically just want to be powering out the legionary cohorts from Sparta. Larissa is in all fairness actually I should be using more often because Larissa is great. By the way, I forgot to mention, um, Larissa, we have actually unlocked the Arcani. Uh, the Arcani are oh, this, this isn't, you know what, let's even go into it. This is basically fiction and nonsense. Arcani exists as an organ, it's not like this, okay? Arcani, unlike what Rome Total War says, were not super badass ninjas who had invisibility cloaks and could hide anywhere on the field or anything, alright? It, it just wasn't. Also, they look really, really good. You know, a unit of infantry that can hide anywhere, good morale, very good stamina, attack 15 with a charge bonus and defense 18. They look fantastic and two hit points, but... Soldier 64. I just never use them because that's just not... They just can't do enough. They don't have enough staying power. I just don't think they're ever worth having. Especially as I believe they do take... Yeah, they take two turns to recruit. Uh, incidentally, uh, so does a Praetorian cohort. Which is why, arguably, given the difference between a Praetorian and a Legionary cohort is modest, I'd always prefer to have two Legionary cohorts than one Praetorian. So for the moment, at least, I'll be going for two Legionaries. Not least as, like, Praetorians get really expensive. Your new army is more expensive than your old one, especially when you get in the infantry. Because, yeah, like, Principes used to be, like, uh, 170. Now, if you want to have Praetorian cohorts, 320. So the upkeep's there, but we've got enough money, so it's fine. And here's Batavium itself, the grand city that actually kind of delivered the Marian reforms. Remember when we took this place over and it was just this crappy, tiny barbarian settlement? Now, now there is this here, the Imperial Palace. Despite the fact that Rome is technically still a republic and not an empire, we just built an Imperial Palace. The Senate probably have a right to get worried at this point. We did just build something with empire in the title, despite the fact that we're not actually an empire. So we've kind of given the game away there. Massive, massive Imperial Palace. Hilariously, in this space that was reserved for the Circus Maximus, we still have basic barbarian stables, just surrounded by a public park, I guess, which is hilarious, together with what now feels like a very small Temple of Juno. It says large Temple of Juno. It feels quite small within the city. We'll probably have to upgrade that at some point. Yes, so yes, here we are. Our first massive big old city, Patavium. Oh, it's a thing of beauty. Oh, and there's the arena. There's the arena over there. Though admittedly, again, there's enough space around it for me to have actually built the final upgrade for that, which is the Colosseum, but I don't think we'll be getting to that for some time. Instead, this large city will just have to make do with a basic arena. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let's actually get the awesome Temple of Juno set up. We can get that upgraded to the Pantheon, our first kind of Pantheon as soon as possible. Dacians are on the move. Not sure about the sound of that, but no offense, the Dacians have enough enemies in the form of, I think, yeah, both the British and the Thracians. Surely they wouldn't be stupid enough to attack me right now. They've got enough problems. Incidentally, just sending one of my diplomats over to the British. I'm kind of wondering if maybe the British would be interested in becoming allies. Because if they would, then I've kind of given up on the Julii not taking Spain. It's pretty clear they're just going to roll over Spain pretty easily at this point with these armies. But once the Julii have taken Spain, if I can make an alliance with the British, if you just kind of look at the mini-map, Britain up to here, me all up to here, 
Where do the Julii expand next? At that point, I'll basically deny them anywhere to expand. And we've always been friendly to the British in the past, so I'm kind of hoping we might be able to have an alliance with those guys, and then the Julii will simply, very soon, run out of anywhere to expand to, which works for me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with three huge cities now part of our empire, with the Marius reform having taken place, very, very exciting indeed. And indeed, with several of our cities now suddenly under siege, I think that is enough for now. We will pick this up next time when we have got to break out and actually have our first major confrontation with the bloody Egyptians, and they have a lot of forces swarming around. So, that's coming up soon. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true death, and this has been Rome Total War. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Don't mind me, I'm just practicing my stabbing motion. It's fine. Oh, you shouldn't have got in the way. You must die. You showed up to a party and you brought a guitar. I despise you. There's two people who are just having sex in this corridor. They're going to go down. Stab, stab. There we are. Like Romeo and Juliet, but sped up slightly. It's, the, it's kind of the footnotes version.